Hello everyone. We'll continue the discussions on columns in this part of the video. And uh, uh, we are uh, in this part of the module, we are going to talk about uh, uh, how we can you know, understand the behavior and design of RC slender columns. Okay. The definition of short column and slender column we have discussed in the first part of the module. We uh, get the effective length and then use effective length and uh, have to calculate your LE by D ratios. And then if it is less than 12, we call them a short column. If it is going to be more than 12, uh, we call them as long columns, right? Anyway, the expected learning outcomes from this part of the module is the student should be able to explain the behavior of RC slender column and then how you know the slenderness are accounted in design and what are the effect of brazing and the differences between brazed and unbraced slender column and explain the code provisions for design of slender column so these are the expected learning outcomes so anyway so this uh, we have discussed for a column that is uh, the ends are pinned uh, pinned and uh, if I apply a load at an eccentricity E, we have seen that it is go, it is a, the, the column pin pin columns are subjected to uh, two end moments of PE at both ends, and uh, it is going to deflect like this. Okay, and at the mid location, you are going to have a deflection delta, like what we have seen here, right? If I take the free body diagram of uh, the top portion of the E. Uh, beam and if you look at it at this particular cross section i am going to have the moment to satisfy this uh, moment equilibrium has to be uh, p into e plus delta right so this is initially e in addition to that we are also having a delta so the total moment applied is going to be p into e plus delta we have seen that now for this particular thing from your uh, uh, bending theory we can express so right right so this is what we are taking this section at distance of x right and if i write this total deflection as y at any cross section we can write this bending equation as ei into d square y by dx square is equal to minus p into y where y is equal to e plus delta for the section that what we have considered and y is going to keep varying right depending upon where we are taking x so this is the bending equation so this is a second order differential equation and if you know the boundary conditions you can solve for the value of your critical buckling load and that critical buckling load works out to be n square pi square ei by l square right uh, depending upon how this column is going to buckle as number of half sine waves n can be 1 or n can be 2 or n can be 3 so multiple values of your critical buckling capacities can be found depending upon how the column is going to buckle right so this we have seen that now from sectional uh, point of view for a particular column let's say you have a uh, same column with some reinforcement that what we have considered right so let's say you have uh, the in the previous part of the module we considered 450 by 450 and then we ended up with some steel, right? Let's say FCK is also given to us 40 megapascal. An area of steel is given as let's say 6000 mm square equally distributed on all four corners, right? For this, we can establish this axial compression bending moment interaction curve. So we we'll discuss that how to get that, right? Now, if we start the same, let's say this is the cross section that I'm having 450 by 450 with a steel of 6000 mm square. We take a cross section. I'm having a square column, right? For this column, we have seen that if I start in, uh, plotting how the load and moment is varying, we have seen that if I'm taking this total length of the column is only, let's say, 3 meters, then you'll find that effective length in this case is L is equal to L which is 3 uh, meters, then you divide by the cross section, you will find that this column is going to be a short column, right? So it is going to be pretty much linear. Moment is going to be just P times E because the delta, what I'm going to get is going to be very, very small for a short column. So you'll get this for a short column of 3 meter length. Uh, then we talked about if I take this 
uh, if i same cross section everything is same if i increase the let's say the length of the column from 3 meters to let's say 10 meters then you will delta will start increasing right so your moment as you apply the more load initially delta will be small and as i apply more and more load your deflection profile is going to increase so additional bending moment p delta what i am going to get to get is going to non linearly increase so that is why your load moment curve also is going to go like this but finally if i am touching this green color curve then we are saying that the section is failing through material failure either concrete reaching is failure strain of 0.002 or your steel is going to yield before concrete reaching its failure strain so when we do that we are effectively utilizing the material which is a material failure right but if a same column same cross section if i take the length as let's say 30 meters then you will find that this column will not be able to reach material failure before it reaches material failure the slope uh, will become zero or uh, uh, slope of load to moment will become zero and uh, or dm by uh, do m by do p will become infinity or do p by do m will become zero and the moment it becomes zero then it leads to a stability failure right so we have seen that this is not a good design so code is not going to allow you to have this kind of a failure so that is why maximum slenderness ratios have been specified uh, as per the is 406 which we have discussed in the previous parts of the module now uh, this column moderately slender column you are allowed to design okay but this is not allowed to design this is allowed to be designed this is allowed to be designed so for a moderately slender column now how do i design for it okay we see that the only same column now what is happening is instead of going uh, uh, it is it is failing at a lower axial load but if you look at if it was a short column this fellow would have gone like this but instead of failing at this level of axial compression now it is failing at a lower axial compression in addition to that instead of resisting this bending moment this column is resisting now this bending moment. okay so we can see that the same column instead of being short if it is becoming a moderately slender column it is failing at a lower axial compression and it is also failing when it is subjected to and it is subject by the virtue of the p delta it is taking more bending moment when it is failing right so if i want to design that column then what i should do i should account for that increase in this bending moment okay which is let's say delta m so somehow if i can account for that additional bending moment that is coming uh, for a moderately slender column then i can design and ensure that still that column is safe enough and it will still reach its material failure but not undergo stability failure so that is what we are going to see how to account for this additional bending moment in the design of moderately slender columns right so we have discussed this uh, uh, in in uh, in depth uh, if the column is part of a braced frame uh, then your effective length uh, values are going to be k value is going to be maximum value is going to be y right for the same column if it is part of an unbraced frame then we find that the minimum value of k is 1 right and the maximum value of k can be infinity which is a pin pin case when it is undergoing sway then you will have uh, issues okay so first thing is we need to find out what are the column we designed whether it is part of a braced frame or an unbraced frame so that again how do we did that we derived the equation in the previous parts of the module what we do is we calculate stability index right so uh, for the stability index again we need to know the lateral flexibility we derived the equation for that also right if you can plug in those values and find q value then you can decide whether the column is part of the braced frame or unbraced frame right so what we can see here is if uh, let's say for this case you have a fixed pick support so there's a fixed pick support this is a pin pin support when you have a pin pin support in a braced case you are you are having only one half sine wave and we know that n is equal to number of half sine waves that are forming in the deformed configuration so in this case you see here you are forming only again two half sine waves so uh, k will become kl will become two to n will become two in this case right so number of half sine waves is nothing but your n right 
So in case of an unbraced frame, you see here, uh, even for a fixed fixed column, n is basically one because this is only half of that sine wave. So uh, half of the half uh, sine wave. So you get only n is equal to one. So uh, and you have a fixed and pinned case, we know that n is equal to 1 by 2 and uh, kl will become 2l. So, our ks is going to become 2. So, as the support is becoming less, more and more less flexible, your effective length is going to increase. And we have to be very careful in case of an unbraced frame because effective length can shoot up uh, depending upon the boundary conditions, right? Now, let's talk about uh, the two important things. Uh, we initially we discussed for a slender column we need to account for this additional bending moment uh, that is coming okay because of the slenderness and the additional p delta moment that is coming let us see there are two effects that we need to consider one is the member stability effect okay so let us see what is it member member stability in this case i am uh, taking a column which is a let's say subjected to moments m1 and m2 at the end and uh, uh, they are restrained, they are not undergoing sway, and uh, it is putting the column to bend like this. And this uh, directions of M1 or M2 are in such a way that it is uh, producing this kind of a deformed shape, or it is bending the column in single curvature. Okay, so the, the curvature of the deformed configuration is not. It is in single direction. That's why we call that a single curvature. When the columns are bent in single curvature, and you will find that the bending moment is going to be, we can write like this. Okay. So at the ends, I'm going to have M2 and M1, and we always take M2 as greater than M1. Okay. As a notation, M2 is the larger moment in a column. Uh, at wherever the end that M2, the larger moment is acting, that we take that as M2. Okay. Now, if we keep increasing the speed, what will happen? The delta will keep increasing. So, by the virtue of this delta, right, again, if I take at this location, you will have, you know, when your P is small, then your delta is also is going to small. So, at this location, now, if you look at it, the moment is going to keep increasing. So, if I again increase the load to next to higher value, my moment profile is going to go like this, right? Because at this, so at this location, there is no delta. At this location, there is no delta. So whatever moment that is there, M1 and M2 will remain same. But the moment I take section here or here, you will find that when I take the free body diagram of one portion above that cut, what I am doing, you will find that you will section will not only have moment from the applied moment, in addition to that, you also have P delta. So that is going to take the form of the deformed configuration, what you are having here. Higher the applied axial compression, higher will be the delta. So you will find that. So this is the way additional moments are going to come when the columns are bending in single curvature. But always you cannot say that uh, you will have columns bending in single curvature. You can also have another case, the columns can be bent in double curvature also. So what is the double curvature? Now the bending moments are going to be changing it in sign. Okay. So we can go back and look at, so what are that sign convention that we took? You know, when you have columns bending like this, then we take that as positive, or when it is bending like this, then we take that as negative. So depending upon, so basically this is the way. So now you look at it, uh, for this kind of convention, one side it will be positive, the other side it will be negative. Again here, also I am taking M2 as a larger moment compared to that of M1, okay? For this column, when it is bent in double curvature, again, when I keep increasing my axial compression, what will happen? You are going to have deformed configuration like this. Okay. So, your delta is going to be uh, somewhere it is going to increase. So, initially at the support location, there is no delta because it is a pin-pin uh, support. I am not allowing any translations. So, as I go below the uh, support points then you will find that the member is going to deflect but it is also having bending moment that is putting that in double curvature so you will have that additional bending moment p delta so it will be somewhere in between either the top or bottom now here in the, as per the sign convention moment is higher there so you will have higher bending higher p delta effect at the uh, top uh, half of the column right 
so uh, this kind of an additional bending that is coming uh, in a braced member whether it is in single curvature or double curvature is what we call that as member stability effect and we find that uh, in in case of a column bend in single curvature now the moment is getting amplified uh, slightly higher okay so you will find that at this section when i take i can have bending moment em plus some p delta which can be greater than m2 okay in this case but in this case if you look at it now the deformed configuration is going like this okay you will find that even if i take at this location uh, your m plus your p delta may be slightly higher than m2 but not very high so in other words when you have a column that is bent in double curvature your total amplification of the moment may not be that high but if you have a column that is bent in single curvature this will be much larger than it can be uh, greater than m2 but here it is it may or may not uh, this pm plus p delta at this particular section may or may not be higher than m2 so depending upon your deformed configuration and the proportions of m2 and m1 that is acting or in other words the member stability effect is going to be more pronounced in case of columns that are bent in single curvature compared to the columns that are bent in double curvature right so that's what the code the ac code is considering this fact and it is saying the difference slenderness effect as this so it is accounting for the signs of moment that are acting at the ends of the column whether the column is bending in single curvature or double curvature when it is bent in single curvature this ratio of m1 by m2 is taken as positive let's say if m1 by m2 is same values then what will happen the ac code says that the slenderness effects may be ignored okay are designed as a short column for a braced column like this so if m1 by m2 is same then what will happen this will become 12 then your slenderness ratio limit is basically le by r i should say le by r should be less than 22 okay this is 22 okay for a short column with the same m1 by m2 as same now if m1 by m2 is uh, different or signs are different uh, now you see m1 and equal but in different signs then what will happen your l by le by ratio uh, this will become 34 plus 12 it will become 46 okay so this is for limit for column bending in single curvature single curvature and le by r will become should be less than 46 for column that is bent in double curvature so the ac code recognizes this fact and uh, it clues it because again for a column that is bent in double curvature your uh, slenderness ratios or higher slenderness ratios are allowed okay this now let's talk about at another effect which is a lateral drift effect with n moments okay what is a lateral drift effect now we talked about in the previous case a braced frame okay that means braced frame means one end of the column is not moving relative to one another it is like this but in this case what we are doing is now i am part of column is part of an unbraced frame where i am allowing sway so one end of the column is free to move with respect to the other end so because of the virtue of this moment what happens now i am having let's say this is the moment that is acting in addition to that i am having this axial force so there is going to be the end support that is moving laterally by magnitude of delta right so and this is a fixed fixed column right and it is moving uh, the top support is moving uh, by a distance of delta with respect to this bottom support right and again this column will have bending moment axial compression shear everything will act so we can idealize this as let's say if i take the free body diagram of only half of this it can be considered like a cantilever okay where from the point of inflection this support is moved by delta b and the bottom is moved by delta e right so and if you look at uh, the bending moment diagram for this column 
and this columns again is bending in double curvature so you have this primary moments again here also what we do m2 is always taken higher than your this is your primary bending moment diagram so m1 and m2 these are primary moments now you find that because the top portion has moved relative to the bottom column and if i take how much it has moved uh, from this point of inflection the top has moved by delta b the bottom has moved by delta a so you will have additional moments even at the top portions of effect p into delta b and p into delta a that has to be added okay that has to be added in addition to that in the deformed configuration in the sphered configuration again the member can deflect within themselves right so that effect is what we call the dis this is the effect which is a member stability effect so that is the additional moment that is coming from your chord rotation that it is coming right so you have two effects so when you have an unbraced frame subjected to n moments which is moving lateral laterally with respect to one end you will have two things one is the lateral drift effect another one is the member stability both of them we have to account for them in our design okay so the additional moments at the column ends caused by vertical load acting on the deflected configuration of an unbraced column is termed as lateral drift effect so if you see the braced columns in the previous uh, slides that what you have seen there was no lateral drift effect it had only member stability that was happening because of the virtue of the deflection profile of the member which is happening between the two ends within the member now you have one end is moving with respect to another so there is going to be an additional p delta moment at the ends of the member itself in addition to that you are also going to have member stability okay so the moment amplification possible due to lateral drift effect in an unbraced column is generally much more than that due to member stability effect in a braced column so braced columns will have only member stability effect but unbraced columns will have both the lateral drift effect and member stability effect in an unbraced column of course the lateral drift effect amplification of moment due to lateral drift effect will be much higher than that of member stability effect now because of this we can say that uh, columns in unbraced frames will be weaker than similar columns in braced frames why again the amplifications of additional moments are going to be higher in case of an unbraced column so it as we have seen it, now then it will it will be subjected to more bending moment means it will fail at a slightly lower axial compression so that is why we say that columns in unbraced frames are weaker than similar columns in braced frames okay now how do we account for this increase in your additional moment okay so the first method is an additional moment method in this method every slender column should be designed for biaxial eccentricities which include the p delta components now what are the p delta components uh, they are saying that additional eccentricity now additional so we always you know uh, we deal in terms of applied eccentricities that applied eccentricities not only we should consider applied eccentricities we should also consider additional eccentricities so what are those additional eccentricities we have seen which should be additional moment divided by axial compression for example additional eccentricity uh, along the x axis will be additional bending moment about y axis divided by pu additional uh, eccentricity along y axis will be additional bending moment x axis divided by pu we have we have seen that right so uh, if i am taking let's say moment about uh, x axis right so we have seen this case again we always take moment about axis okay so if i am taking moment about x axis you have eccentricities which is ey in addition to that the code is saying that you have to take additional eccentricity that will come from your slenderness surface okay so this is the additional moment. not only this primary bending moment, this is primary moment okay applied moment these are your additional moment both of them i have to account for them in my design right so similarly bending moment about y axis will be pu times ex plus ax This is your primary bending moment. This is your additional bending moment about y axis. 
now let us say how to express this additional bending if i take this max let's say what is max somehow i have to find a value for this additional eccentricities so code is suggesting this additional eccentricity is dx by 2000 times lex by dx whole square so now how do we get this value so that we will discuss so this is your additional eccentricity eax okay so dx by 2000 times lex by dx the whole square now let us see how we get this additional eccentricity now next procedure is a uh, strength reduction coefficient method uh, in this procedure where it is given in b3.3 of the code the permissible stresses in concrete and steel are reduced by multiplication with strength reduction coefficient in fact uh, um, the permissible stresses this is valid for working stress method uh, when we account for the slender column but uh, that equation is given by uh, strength reduction coefficients 1.25 minus le by 48 times d or it is 1.25 minus le by 160 r minimum where r minimum is your radius of variation l is your effective length but we know that for column design working stress method is uh, not correct because the stress levels are not going to remain constant it is going to keep changing because of the creep and other effects right so this method is actually uh, not really uh, people use it uh, but this has been suggested in is 446 what we actually use is a additional moment that we have given this this is the method that we are going to use okay right so now i have explained you how to get this additional eccentricity okay now the additional eccentricity is okay e let's say ax is proportional to what is the delta that is possible somehow i have to relate this additional eccentricity to the delta that is going to come right so delta is your deflection profile of the column so what uh, the code has considered is they have considered for a braced 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 column with uh, let's say n moments with first cases let's say column which is subjected to constant moment okay when you have a column that is subjected to constant bending moment we can uh, establish this curvature distribution as constant okay assume that this curvature distribution is constant okay which is m by ei so if this curvature distribution is given because the bending moment is going to be constant so the curvature distribution is also going to be constant now what would be delta how do we relate curvature and uh, delta delta is nothing but a double integration of your curvature distribution right so double integration of your curvature or in other words in conjugate beam method that you have done how do you get your deflection you load the conjugate beam by m by ei which is your curvature then you take the moment when you take the moment of your m by e actually what you are doing is you are integrating the curvatures to get rotation and then integrating the rotation to get your deflection so when you do that you get your uh, uh, delta as in this delta max is p l square by 8 which is nothing but your moment so when your beam is subjected to constant curvature of phi when you take moment which is your delta at the mid span is nothing but your p l square by 8 so that's how we get your delta now another uh, case is your actual scenario will be you know somewhat the distribution of your cur uh, curvature will be like this okay so okay so this is one idealized condition this is an another idealized condition okay so this is the curvature distribution when you have a point load which is acting in the middle of let's say uh, a pin pin a column right so for that we know that a bending moment is going to be like this right and uh, if you calculate this curvature which is going to be uh, for this curvature distribution let's say if this is p2 then this for this curvature delta will be delta max will be basically p2 times l square by 12 if you, when you do the integration uh, for the triangular load and you will find that um, mid span deflection is going to be uh, p2 into l square by 2 again what is curvature curvature can be expressed in terms of m by a that's what we do it in a conjugate method right so if you do that for these two scenarios this is your first scenario for uh, columns with n moments 
constant end moment. Second case when you have a let's say concentrated load that is acting in the middle. So you get these two curvature distributions. But in reality, whatever that moment profile that is going to come from your analysis, it is going to be somewhere between these two extreme cases. Okay, it is not going to be triangular or it's not going to be uh, uh, constant. So your curvature distribution is going to be somewhere, somewhat in between. So why is it we are talking about curvature distribution here? Because curvature and delta are related. Now, once I know delta, then I can relate delta to additional eccentricity. So that is the reason we are talking about curvature distribution because that is linked to, to delta. Now the delta is linked to, to additional eccentricity, right? So let's see now. Uh, so that's why we are saying that. So for a practical case, we are finding that for this case, your delta max that is going to happen is going to lie between p max l square by 12 and p max l square by 8. So we can take an average value of p max l square by 10 because between 8 and 12, we take average values p max l square by 10. So now let us see the relation. So why we are doing this? This is the relationship between uh, delta max and curvature in a pin jointed uh, braced slender column. Okay, so this has been done for a slender column. Now we have found out what is the relationship between delta and curvature. Now let me make an assumption for a calculating curvature in terms of your depth. Okay, so let's say that I am having a section like this, okay, a rectangular section like this. And it is subjected to an axial compression like this at certain eccentricity E plus delta max. Right? So for this, then you know what is the equivalent load? This section will be subjected to PU. In addition to that, you will have MU, which is equal to PU times E plus delta max. Right? So this is the section that is subjected to axial compression and a bending moment, which is PU into E plus delta max. Let's assume that uh, neutral axis is uh, within the section and it is creating a close to balanced condition. Okay, so uh, what would be the condition for a balanced condition? Then I know on the tension side this is equal to epsilon y and this is equal to point not not three right and this distance we know this the entire distance is t we know right. So once your top strain is fixed and steel strain is fixed for balance condition, we know that we can estimate your XU, which is your XC max, which is your balance condition as per your IS code, right? Now only thing is, uh, instead of strain equal to yield strain, I'm going to take slightly a smaller because you know we have three different grades of steel. For FP415, okay, if you go back. What is the yield strain epsilon y? Epsilon y is nothing but 415 divided by 2 into 10 to the power of 5. That works out to be 0.00207. Okay, so that is the reason the code is taken for uh, finding out an expression for an additional to say, right? That has to be related to delta. Now the delta has to be related to curvature. So I need to find some what kind of curvature that I need to use in your calculation. Here we are saying a uh, 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 for a column, you are going to be a balanced condition. It is need not be true because your axial compression levels can be much higher than your balanced condition. Or if you are uh, having large bending moment, your curvature can be uh, or your, your axial loads can be low also. But uh, I need to have some level of reference. So the reference is taken as balanced condition here, right? So for these strain condition, then curvature we know how to calculate this curvature. Curvature is nothing but your slope. So if I know epsilon cu and epsilon st that I am fixing, and this distance is basically what are the distance? This distance is, you know, it is d minus t prime. So epsilon cu plus epsilon st divided by this distance will give me the curvature, or in other words, slope. We have done in your flexural calculation, so we can do that. So if you do that, and d minus d prime here is taken as 0.9d, and effective curve generally we take it about 10 percent of your total depth, right? So this is your curvature. So what the code is saying is, okay, let me assume that this delta max is going to be uh, contributing the majority of the curvature. Okay. So whatever that 
moment that is coming from this delta is what it is going to create all the additional coverage. So they are saying that 80 percentage of the total moment is actually the additional moment. Okay. So if I put 0.8. And then if I simplify this ratios, then you will find that this works out to be 1 by 200 D. So the curvature is 1 by 200 D for a close to balanced condition. Okay. Okay. Now you can ask me why are you taking 0 0.002? Uh, because balance strain is going to be different for FE 500. Yes, true. But you know, uh, uh, this I am taking that FE 415 because you have multiple grade subsidy. I am doing the calculation for FE 415. Uh, for example, if I am taking slightly uh, higher grades of steel, of course, this value is going to go up. Huh? This number is going to be slightly different. But uh, code wants to have simplified expressions for estimating what are the uh, additional bending moments. So we are taking for FE 415 for curvature at balanced condition, uh, uh, failure is going to be 1 by 200D. Now, we know that additional eccentricity E by D is related to delta max by D. And delta max by d is related to curvature, and uh, delta max is what p l square by 10. Delta max by d is p max l square by 10 d. Okay, so if we do uh, this curvature, we got 1 by 200 d. When I multiply it by l square uh, by d, then you get basically e a by d can be expressed as l by d square divided by 2000. So this is the way we get the expression for your additional eccentricity. Right, so that's what the code is saying. So you have to take this additional eccentricity and multiply with the axial compression to get your additional bending moment. And we need to do for both the axes, both about x-axis as well as about y-axis. Right, so you get your bending moment like this. These are the additional bending moments that we need to uh, consider when we are designing a slender column. Again, how is this all related? It is related from p delta additional moments. Now delta is related to curvature. Now curvature uh, is uh, estimated for a balanced condition but depending upon the level of axial compression that I can slightly modify using some reduction coefficient. So that we will see how to do that. But this is the way that we get to you do your additional bending moment. Okay. Right. Okay. So we can say uh, when your PU is more than uh, uh, PU balanced then we can say that the failure mode will be controlled by compression and the corresponding e by d uh, is low okay or your because when the column is subject to high axial compression your curvature will not be this much right and we have seen that when the section becomes compression controlled curvature at failure is going to be low so your delta is also going to be low so the code recognizes fact and uh, suggesting low curvature so Whatever that we have delta that what we have estimated, it is valid only for balanced failure condition, which may not be true when you have high axial compression. So you need not take that much additional eccentricity, you can reduce it. So that's what the code is saying that in such a situation, if you use this, uh, then you can result in very conservative designs, which may not be correct. Okay. So the code is saying that when you have very high axial compression loads, this additional moments can be reduced by some multiplying factors or reduction factors. Let's say what are those reduction factors. Again, the reduction factors are Kax and Ky, which is expressed as ratio of the difference between the pure axial compression capacity to the demand divided by pure axial compression capacity to balanced compression capacity. Right. So we need to do for when Pu becomes more than balanced capacity. I need to apply this reduction factor. Okay, when PU becomes more than PU uh, BX, obviously, then this value will have high, and this value will be uh, denominator will be higher than your numerator. So it becomes basically like a reduction factor. And that reduction factor I need to account for about both axes, right? Because uh, in a square column, you will have all these values will be same, but when you have a rectangular column. Your uh, uh, balanced uh, axial compression capacity about both the axes will be different. That is the reason PUBX and PUBY are going to be different about both axes. Right? So you can see that K varies linearly from 0 to unity and is a highly simplified formula. Okay? And this uh, reduction factors are not applicable when PU is less than PUB. Okay? And uh, there you have to take K equal to 1. 
okay when the section becomes tension control in fact curvatures can increase but the code is saying that co columns are anyway uh, we 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 use a compression members you are not going to have very huge demand for like a pure bending case so the more uh, generic loading case will be pu is more than uh, balanced condition right so that is the reason k is kept as one when your uh, axial compression um, is uh, uh, less than balanced load right so now what are the demands that i need to consider so we have seen in your raised columns your primary bending moment m2 will be there and m1 will be there there is going to be a variation so code is saying that you take 0.4 of this plus 0.6 of your higher moment and make sure that it is at least greater than 0.4 m2 because anyway we are taking additional bending moment so for design what i need to take is primary bending moment plus additional bending moment. we have derived an expression for additional bending moment. what is primary bending moment primary bending moment for raised column should be 0.4 times m1 plus 0.6 times m2 that value has to be greater than 40 percentage of your largest moment okay so this is the way we take so m u design anyway uh, when we calculate this additional moment will add that has to be greater than m2 for a braced column so anyway m u design you cannot take less than m2 which is the largest moment that is acting in the one end of the column right and where mp is the primary bending moment and m u design is your total design moment now for an unbraced column and uh, we have seen that lateral drift effect we need to consider say for example unbraced column here if it is bending in double curvature you will have this delta p delta effect that will be there at the both ends that we need to account for now this would be your total moment m2 plus ma okay so the lateral drift moment comes approximate way of accounting for this assuming that additional moment ma acts at the column end where the maximum primary moment m2 is operational so this is what it so m2 is larger so we take this moment as your total moment for your design okay so uh, for a braced column again we go back this primary bending moment is 0.4 m1 plus 0.6 m2 but that also should be greater than 0.4 m2 the total moment for design can never be less than it okay so but for an unbraced column definitely you have to add this ma to m2 so you are taking a larger design moment for an unbraced column compared to that of a braced column even for the same column if it is bending in double curvature in both cases the demand i need to consider for a unbraced column is much higher and we know the reason because unbraced column is going to have larger p delta moment that is the reason the code is according for this.